Historical illiteracy is not a right or left issue. It can manifest itself in groups that straddle either end of the political spectrum. However, in the US, the historical illiteracy of the millennial generation takes on an entirely new dimension of confounding. In that, a majority of millennials would prefer to live in a socialist, communist, or fascist nation rather than the current system they live under today. That is, at least according to a recent poll. As of now, identity politics and the retribalization of the West marches on inextricably forward. And this is to the consternation of those such as Professor Jordan Peterson, who while sage in much of his advice, looks increasingly to be a completely out of touch boomer when it comes to his calls for radical individualism in response to the societal death rattle of political fragmentation currently looming over the United States and the wider Western world. In fact, Professor Peterson seems as though he doesn't even have a single foot planted in the lived reality of those outside of academia or TV studios. And whether we like it or not, and barring a catastrophic event that erases the divide, identity politics will continue to flourish and dominate the political landscape for at least the foreseeable future, and we will learn why in just the next few minutes. This video is sponsored by Armada Modern Tank, which is a free mobile game that plunges you into intense modern tank warfare with player versus player blitz games, different modes of combat, excellent graphics, as well as diverse battle areas. It's available on Android, iOS, Facebook, Windows, Amazon, and Steam. Support BPS by installing Armada right now using the links in the description and get 100 gold, 100,000 silver, and a VIP account. This is a huge bonus. See you out there. As the browning of America continues and while white Americans will for the first time become a minority in the country by mid-century, a 2012 study showed that more than half of white Americans believe that whites have replaced blacks as the primary victims of discrimination. And with this unprecedented peacetime demographic transformation currently underway, there is now much evidence that ongoing changes in the United States are increasing white racial identity. And despite this monumental shift in demographics and white perception, a recent survey found that 43% of black Americans do not believe America will ever make the changes necessary to give blacks equal rights. So now, the radical devolution of the United States' melting pot identity, begun by the left and greatly accelerated since at least the 1990s, demands the neediness of labeled differences, some true, some imagined, to be recognized in all facets of society. This movement emphasizes group consciousness, group identity, and most importantly, group claims. Once groups rally around the sentiment that they are being treated with indifference or discrimination, attitudes to the outgroup harden, as do demands for reparations or more to the point, the transfer of power from one group to another. Identity groups are by their very nature exclusive and uncooperative. This is best exemplified by the fixation of labels and not only the ones people self-identify with, but by other groups that seek to vilify and denigrate other people for having ideas or an identity that differs from their own. In recent years, even affiliation of political party designates to the outgroup a cartoonish version of your moral compass, either one of xenophobia and religious conservatism, or supporting the murder of the unborn and celebrating the sexualization of children. In the arena of 21st century identity politics, boogeymen are created and nuance does not exist. In place of listening and of subtlety, suspicion and assumptions create the foundation for the vilification and hate we see all around us today. When groups feel threatened, they retreat into tribalism. When groups constantly focus on real and imagined intent, 
of other groups, as well as real and imagined oppression or persecution, the ground is fertile for hostility and within communities, disunity as differing groups lash out at one another. In America, and almost every country in the West, every group to some extent is now coalescing around tribal political affiliation. Whites, blacks, men, women, straight, gay, the transgendered, atheists, the obese, feminists, Islamists, masochists, anarchists, liberals, conservatives, with new splinter groups forming, it would seem daily. However, with so many wrapped exclusively in their restrictive us versus them mentality, Canada, the United States, the UK, and many other nations in the West now find themselves in the perilous position of no longer having anything that unites the increasingly diverse communities living in the same space. And with ever more potentially disaffected tribes flowing into destination countries daily, other than vapid slogans such as diversity is our strength, the ties that bind are paper thin if they exist even at all. As it historically has been the left that has supported this shift from unity toward diversity and the accompanying rise of group identity politics away from individualism, it has created a situation where many communities and indeed whole nations where the ideological lines have become so entrenched it is basically almost impossible to bridge the divide. When looking at the United States in particular, but this analysis could also be carried over again to the vast majority of nations in the West, what you have is a situation where further radicalization has been the direct result of economic policies begun in the 1980s that saw the offshoring of the industrial base of the country and policies that were carried out on behalf of mega corporations, their shareholders, and the mega rich. As a result, left-wing parties really began losing their blue-collar support in the 1990s, and this required the left to find a new voting base, and this also included importing one. And what they could not import, they continually bribe with bread and circuses, as well as shifting their priorities farther and farther to the farthest fringes of not only the left, but of sanity. This slide into radical socialism and far-left demagoguery has now seen that in Europe at least, right-wing parties surging everywhere across the continent and with the seemingly far-left shift of the Democratic Party in the US focusing on ever smaller hills to die on and increasingly openly leftist candidates that are extreme, there is no reason to believe that in the US it will not suffer the same and similar fate. And this is also cutting along racial lines, as the racial plantation that the Democratic Party has cultivated going all the way back to the Johnson administration is seeing more and more people, white and black, walking away. But still, the subversion has been incredible in its breadth and scope. An entire generation has been so thoroughly indoctrinated that now, as stated previously, a majority of millennials have said that they would prefer to live in a socialist or communist country, and a very small number saying fascist, rather than the free enterprise republic that is the United States. And the best example of these developmentally challenged millennials are the comrades of the domestic terrorist group Antifa. And being the true useful idiots they are, are in fact ironically prosecuting their revolution and that revolution will ultimately benefit the 1%. That's because the agenda of these asshats, generally middle class malcontent kids, helps facilitate the growing wealth inequality in the Western world and the United States in particular. This is via their rabid religious commitment to the global proletariat revolution and thus open borders. Their flooding of their own nations with massive numbers of people and these people swell the labor force and drive down wages, especially at a time of computerization, robotics, automation, and artificial intelligence. Well, they are undermining the one thing that has helped the working class against being exploited by the capital class, and that being a stable population that allows for wage growth, at least in tandem with inflation. 
Which goes to show that the brains, if you could call them that, behind groups like Antifa don't care much about either the working class or of immigrants. What they care about is the dissolution of power, which in the US and Europe, in their minds, is white supremacy. And like every tribal group, acquisition of power is much more desired than giving power to individuals. Hence the, we need more strong women of color in power, as opposed to we need competent people in power. In fact, if you look at the focal point of everything the far left does, it is about an egalitarianism of power between all members of society and the erasure of hierarchy. This is why they have no problem using institutions of power such as academia, tech companies and the media to crush those hierarchies of power and silencing any that disagree with them without seeing the cognitive dissonance required for their position. And this Frankenstein creation that the far left has mutated into is now forcing those on the center left, center as well as the center right, most of whom are comfortable characterizing themselves as individuals into the identity politics game, if for no other reason they are feeling threatened and surrounded by hostile and increasingly anger-filled tribes of people. Now, the problem with people like Professor Peterson and others is that they seem to be incapable or simply unwilling to recognize why identity politics is in the ascent while at the same time pretending that there is no such thing as group identity, especially in an era of mass uncontrolled immigration by extremely tribal groups of people that are currently flooding in. Simply put, groups that practice nepotism, identitarianism, and tribalism will dominate over groups that do not in this new, diverse, and enriched society we are building in the post-Western world. At this point, not only reality has moved on, but so has the debate, and Professor Peterson's ideas of radical individualism in the current social climate doesn't provide any solutions to the problems faced in 2018 as they might have had in 1978. Only in a world where there is no identity at all or a strong shared identity will individualistic policies and ideas such as those espoused by Mr. Peterson lead to a meritocratic utopia. But that place is not America, nor is it Canada, Australia, or the UK. Worshipping at the altar of individualism, as he does, is equally wrong as those that talk in such words as comrade, the revolution, socialism, and everyone that disagrees with me is Hitler are. It is important to improve individually and it is important to add to the collective, but it is also very clear that politics is identity and the negotiation between different in and out groups. America has become dangerously divided. For a nation, it is a failing survival strategy to cut yourself off from a shared unified group identity. The idea that you could smash the common unified cultural consensus and create a nation of disparate and unrelated people focused on diversity and held together with slogans and scotch tape and not have it wither into tribal identity politics is the height of arrogance or probably more apt stupidity. But here we are. And one very important thing to consider is this. The solutions are there to the nightmare of identity politics. We only need to look back to go forward. What do you think could help solve the tragedy of the commons? Leave me your thoughts in the description below. Thanks for watching. If you liked this video, please consider subscribing. Also remember to support this channel by downloading and installing Armada Modern Tank. Links are in the description below. Thanks and I'll see you next time.